So how many of you are startups uh, that with revenue? Cool. How many of you are startups that are not with revenue yet? How many of you feel your product is ready for market? Wait a second. So the revenue dudes don't feel your product is ready for market? Good. Well, then you're ready for a master class. That sounds good. Um, so, uh, okay. Well, that's, it's good to meet all of you. Um, I'm going to cover a few things today. Uh, what we do is we think in terms of uh, uh, cross-border market aspirations. So I ought to ask how many of you have potential in your future cross-border market aspirations? Ah, cool. Everybody wants to go to America someday. Um, and so the agenda would be a little bit about what we do so you understand why maybe we do or do not uh, help you in this. Uh, what I think is trending in the U.S. marketplace, which I'm sure will not uh, surprise many of you, uh, and the notion that it is a channel-driven marketplace. You don't rock up to anyone in America and sell your stuff. In fact, Microsoft doesn't even sell its stuff. Channels. Uh, sell things. So we're going to spend a little bit of time, serious time today, on what we mean by a channel-driven marketplace and what are channel partners and how those channel partners think. We'll talk about some considerations that you might want to think about with U.S. market and then funding. How many of you want funding? I don't think that was everybody, which is good. I like that. Uh, lean and mean, right? That's good. A uh, little bit about us. Uh, we do things only under one filter. I'm going to tell you about my filter in the hopes that you guys, too, have a filter. And what do I mean by filter? I like to make my decisions based on my filter, which is I don't want a client uh, that I can't articulate attainable deliverables to. Apply some measurability to them. So an attainable deliverable might be I'm going to introduce you to eight VCs in Silicon Valley. Measurability will be they will give you money and how much. And we want relationships that are sustainable. So we don't want quick hits. We want relationships that can last for a very long time. Uh, we do market presentation and representation gets you into markets, sometimes gets you money. And we have offices in Tel Aviv, New York, DC, and we're here a lot in Melbourne. Uh, some of the clients that you may be familiar with from the sort of Victorian Australian world are on the, on the screen. Uh, what we think is trending in the ICT space, I should ask, are you all ICT companies? Pretty much, right? No. Is it? no. Can I hear who's not an ICT company? What do you, what do you sell? International education and migration. And without, indeed, ICT? So is there an ICT component to your... No, there will be some IT component, like, you know, having this database of all the... Right, right. Yeah, cool. So by the way, we, we do a lot of online education, a lot of uh, CSR education. Um, uh, companies like Reed Global, a Clinton Global Initiative winner with, uh, with uh, education centers in Nepal. Um, and a lot of that ends up being empowering ICT. So some of the biggest innovation in, in, uh, in ICT really comes from the disempowered and disenfranchised and giving them access to information. Uh, as, you, as you would know. Um, and by the way, if you were a natural products company, we could talk about that too. And a lot of the same things apply. But I suppose other than you, anybody else with a product that isn't ICT related? Yeah. Um, mine is the education and distribution of, of teas. Of teas, did you say? Yeah, medicinal. Medicinal, right. So that's interesting. And I think the ICT people, people the ICT folks might be interested in some, folk, in some facts and figures that might re, uh, speak to you. So I'm going to pick you. I'm going to pick on you for a few moments. Um, so if I was selling medicinal teas, I'd want to understand channel partners. I'd want to understand what's trending. Well, what's trending is natural products. Natural organic organic products have 43 percent growth in America. Why? Because they're driven by a Gen Y values conscious decision maker. In the globe, around the globe, 65% of Western decision makers are what we call the connected generation. 
They're unlike the baby boomers who were consumers of goods. They're a new generation that think about sustainability, the environment, health, new ways of getting information. They're connected digitally, so you want to have something that tells, their, tells your story. The way I would sell using channels into America is I'd understand the channels. The channels in America, if they were supermarkets, are 36,000 doors that sell food in America, 36,000. To give that perspective to my Australian friends, if you take all the Coles and Woolies combined in this country, you're talking about 1,600 stores. 1,600 stores, America's got 36,000. So you gotta understand the scale. And this is true for ICT, but I'm gonna focus on T for fun because it's a good way to understand why I'm taking you through the next slides. So you gotta know what's trending, which is the slide we're on and for the ICT folks. And good news, you got something cool, organic, medicinal, it's trending. But so now how do you go to those 36,000 stores? If I ask you, if, have you ever been to New York? So if you were to go to America, I'm gonna bet that if I asked you after going to New York to a whole bunch of supermarkets, which one would you sell your medicinal teas? You'd probably say Whole Foods, which is this really beautiful supermarket with a lot of whole natural things. But with 36,000 stores selling products, Whole Foods has 280 stores in five different regions. Not good, not good. That's five different buyers, five different places to store your teas, five different distribution channels. Whereas if you, got to, if you went to whole, uh, Winn-Dixie and Publix, two southeastern supermarket chains, that's 2,200 stores. Port of Melbourne, container to Atlanta, you're done and you just trumped your whole country. Coles and Woolies, 1,600. When dixie and Publix 2200. So that, I just demonstrate for you ICT folks what I mean by scale and what we mean by channel partners and what we call stealth market entry points for our friend in the T. Then it can get more complicated, don't mean to show off, but there's MLM, multi-level marketing, which by the way sells medicine, medicinal stuff. There is get on Dr. Oz, because if on the Dr. Oz TV show they say this tea is good, you're done, you're retired, buy a new house. Uh, and then there's other kind of tricks to the trade, right? So very cool thing to be in, good stuff, but for the purpose of the analogy, we're gonna focus on, we gotta know what's trending to know how we fit, we gotta know what we stand for, and then we gotta identify channel partners. So with that, let's start with trending. So trending in ICT. Uh, when I think about industry-specific digitization, whatever your ICT value proposition is today, maybe it fits in a specific sector or industry. And if you've got an application for one specific industry, maybe it's uh, applicable to another one that's spending money. Anybody want to volunteer and tell me their ICT thing in one sentence? Come on, be, channel your inner New Yorker. Be, don't be a Melbourne person. Yes, Rome. HR management software for events companies. Okay, HR management software events companies. And it's going to give what value to the event company or the applicant? For the events companies, it saves them headaches for not having to use Excel, paper, Word, all those things, multiple phone calls, collating availability from various sources, does all for them, saves them a hell of a lot of time on that front. And for the employee, it can be done from their phone, they can set their availability, they've got all their shits in one place, it's not, you know, Right, and the employee is that cater waiter, which might be a Melbourne Uni person, or might be a uh, perhaps immigrant in in a country that's sending money home. Right? Would that be fair? Okay. So the first point is sector hospitality. Where what what's spending? Who's spending? So when we think about how to enter a sector, if Kimpton Hotels, which is a switched on sustainable, really cool hotel group, wants to empower transient workers, meaning the uni student to my cater waiter, they might be a good target. But the other point is, as I said, multiple sectors. If you're the company that can serve that population of those uni students who are cater waiters, 
guess what? You might be relevant to the likes of LinkedIn that want to acquire more user groups of people when they're in uni and help onboard them into other things. So that's what we mean by understanding your landscape across sectors. The next thing we think about is enterprise mobility. So of course, Rowan so switched on, as we all know in this room, that for sure, your particular product and service has a mobile interface, I would think. And so enterprise mobility is trending. Doesn't mean much, you all know that. But what does that mean? That means content delivery, great UI, user interface, uh, the fact that folks bring their own devices to whatever they apply and do, and then um, good BI. So I bet you, because I know we all, we all know what Rowan switched on, you've got some good business intelligence, right? That catering company can know who's interacting and so forth. So that, that's important. Uh, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but I think it's important to recognize w w what's trending. Socialization. So you can gamify an experience, not every experience, not everything's about games. But you could. You could make a challenge in a game out of even applying to be a cater waiter. Um, you want to appify experience. So by having a local native app on a device, you've now brought what would have been a boring internet interface of a website onto something that's in the hands, thus more empowering, thus more quick on the fly. Um, when you're doing that, you gotta think about uh, time and date stamps. Because if I'm that catering hall hiring the uni student for cater waitering, I might want to know where he's located, he or she. Because I don't want them to be late for catering. You know? So geocentric relationships are important. Uh, and when they, when they, they apply. Um, uh, cloud migration, you all know. Big data, you all know. I wouldn't get too lost in the word big data or cloud for that matter. But, but, but I'd, I'd understand where you fit in that storyline. Um, cybersecurity. How many of you, on the ICT folks in the room, how many of you reverse proxy to one, one or both directions of your uh, content delivery? How many of you know what that means? Nobody raised their hand when I asked if you reverse proxy between your server and the internet. How many of you have what you would consider um, a DMZ between your private network interaction and your public internet connection? Okay, two people, good, for, good on you. What's your company? Financial Austin. Yeah, uh, okay, so that's problematic. Because if you're selling to, meaning the rest of you, you guys are right, maybe. Um, the rest of you, if you're selling an enterprise product, an enterprise product, a company's gotta let you touch it, it's gonna be concerned about what kind of protocol you have between your private network and your public network. Just in case we're not clear on the tech, how many of you think you do or you open a map port to connect from one place to another in your tech? How many people don't? How many people don't know what I'm talking about? All right. So to state the obvious, cybersecurity and network security is really important. We all know that. Got to get educated on this stuff and know how to protect your open connections to the public internet uh, and exposure. The last thing I call trending is something that isn't trending in, well, is trending everywhere except Australia, unfortunately. And that's called teaming. And what do I mean by teaming? If I'm somebody who's going to buy from you a solution, in all likelihood, I'm looking for more solutions than the one in particular that you're selling me. That's just reality. So whether I'm the CTO of a company, or I'm a consumer, or I'm any buyer any of you are pitching to, I'm looking at more than just your idea, okay? So I'm looking for sometimes A to Z solutions. And if you've got the greatest social media solution for me, or the greatest BI, business intelligence solution, or the greatest cybersecurity solution, I'm gonna buy it from you. Let's assume you have me at a low. I'm buying it. Why should I then worry about, oh, wait, how am I gonna integrate it with the other three things I bought? Right, you just created a problem even if you had me at a low. So it seemed to me that it makes sense to team. So if five of you have a solution for me, team up. 
Don't trade NDAs. Don't have too much Melbourne coffee shop discussions. Come together and sell me something integrated. That's a teaming agreement. So you get in the door, your mate who's selling something else follows you in the door, and everybody's making money. That's a collaborative atmosphere. This is not goofy ideas about collaboration, right? In Silicon Valley, when you go to a bar, people, they don't say mate, but they say, hey mate, what are you working on? They just don't say mate, they say, hey, what are you working on? In Melbourne, you guys meet at a bar and you're like, what are you working on? I'll have to send you an NDA and check with my lawyer. The lawyer's robbing you, that's ridiculous. Collaborate, because usually, in nine times out of 10, before you protect your IT, go to market. And if your friend, or your competitor, or your competing product that isn't offering exactly what you're offering could get you in the door, why would you not do that? So, teaming's pretty good. The next slide I'm literally gonna skip. I'll send it to you. Uh, it's just trends. All this really slide means is that you probably need to look at the US if you're looking to scale. And let's just stick to the uh, medicinal teas, right? Scale is important. 1,600 calls and woolies versus 36,000 stores. Now, might as well try for the 36,000 stores, right? So uh, that, that's, that's this slide. We're going to go to the next one. Relevant segments. So when you're talking about your, your particular IT brand, probably important to know where you fit. And these are seg segments that maybe you touch all of them or some of them, important to understand. I'm not gonna repeat it because it's a little repetitive, but it's good to understand the stats and the growth in those segments. Now, like we said, it's a channel-driven marketplace. So what do we mean by that? There are different kinds of channel partners. Some are custom system builders. A bloke is told by a bank, build me more mobility or build me more online learning to make our customers or our bankers smarter. Uh, or a, a company that just comes up with their own ideas. They can be a channel partner. They're not a competitor, contrary to Melbourne culture. They can be your friends, because even though they're creating their own IP, they're happy to channel partner yours and integrate it into things. So they're one kind of channel partner. Another is our consultants. Consultants, consultants can be very annoying or very big, or very big and annoying, like Accenture. Um, <laughs> But, but, but the, so they can take your value proposition and take you into their clients. But they're certainly a channel partner that you want to understand. IT or telco, so the Telstras, the AT&Ts of the world, Telstra business centers, they can be channels uh, for you. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but, but I'm trying to give you a concept of who are channel partners out there. And while I'm on telcos, I'm gonna go a little further. If you talk to some switched on advisors here, or some switched on VCs here in uh, Melbourne. They'll tell you, I'm gonna give you a million dollars and the first thing I want you to do is spend $300,000 on a switched on CEO in America. And then I'm gonna spend, you're gonna spend another $400,000 on marketing. Not necessarily. AT&T, the Telstra, of one of the Tel Telstra-like entities in America, they have something called the Enterprise Mobility Salesforce. Okay, I'm gonna give you an example of a channel partnership. That's 5,000 folks whose job it is to convince you, I don't have my cell phone on me, to sign a contract for two years with AT&T. So they're knocking on the door of, let's say, Bank of America or of a small law firm, and they're saying, switch to AT&T. Over the last year or so, those folks are given a quota. They no longer sell this boring thing called churn. Churn is the amount of people who sign with AT&T versus Verizon. They now, and they're fired if they don't, they now have a quota, you gotta sell a million dollars in software. Now, why do you think that is? Because software and apps drive churn, right? You, you gotta know your customer. Maybe they need e-forms, maybe they need Rowan's solution for cater waiters and the like. Maybe they need any of your solutions in the room. Well, before you'd hire this supposed switched on American big talking CEO, if you could get into AT&T and have 5,000 blokes sell your stuff, wouldn't that be a good solution? So that's a channel partnership defined. 
Um, next one is managed service providers. They can be channels. Uh, then something we call market in, in originators. Sometimes they're hybrids of all of these things, but basically someone who's connected into a specific sector, someone who really knows hospitality. I gave Rowan one, and I'll use it as an illustration. A uh, young lady who was the ED, the executive director of the largest hotel, restaurant, and lodging organization in America. She happens to have just left her job. Rowan makes a deal with her, he's done. Not to be his CEO, but to introduce his terrific solution to eight or nine hospitality companies like the likes of Carnival Cruises. You're done, Rowan just had a good day. System integrators, uh, software developers, and VARs. Anybody know, does everybody know what a VAR is? Value added reseller. It's essentially a VAR is a value added reseller. Here's the way they work and then the stat is gonna shock you. The way a value added reseller works is approximately, they take either 25% or 30% of your money and they roll you out. Microsoft SharePoint, everybody's heard of that? It's sold only through VARs. And the VARs make 30%, okay? That's a good deal. That means if they give you a million dollars, they made 300,000. In other countries, like Europe, there's VODs. VOD is a value-added distributor. They take, 20, they take 50%, because they keep 20% to be you in that country. They're essentially you. You don't hire the supposedly switched on CEO. The VOD rolls you out across the entire hospitality sector if you're Rowan, or the entire law, law, law firm sector, whatever sector they roll you in. They take 20%, and guess who they use for the other 30%? VARs. Everything's channel partner driven. Web developers you mentioned. But so now you have to understand who those channel partners are. So this is channel partner organizations. How many? I don't have the total, but it's 180,000 some odd companies in America are channel partners. That's a lot. And none of them are all due respect to Aussies, rocking up saying, "Man, buy my stuff. It's all through channels, okay? You have to understand how they sell. So this pie breaks those channels up by who they're selling to. Are they selling to companies that are making a half a million dollars? Or are they selling to companies that are making half a billion and up? So it's interesting to see how those channels segment. Then are they selling to large companies, 100 employees or more? What things are they selling? So this is even more into how those channel partners break up. Security, health, telecommunications. You need to understand this because back to the tea company, medicinal teas, what you would do if we were working with you is you would order spins data. Write it down, it's really cool. Spins data is Nielsen data on those 36,000 supermarkets. Remember them? 36,000 supermarkets. Spins is off the register. It's like Nielsen data from the barcode. But how cool is this? It'll tell you every company in America of across 36,000 stores that sells something that's a tea with some remedial or beneficial benef uh, benefit. Now, how cool would that report be? It would tell you the price. It will tell you what the benefits are, and it will tell you who's selling it, i.e. channel partners. And that's pretty important, right? So before you go to Austrade and take a booth for $20,000 to vet wave at the booth with Austrade and a couple of pictures of kangaroos and koalas, I never understand that at the show, uh, I would get the spins data, right? And know who can take your tea into the market. Uh, so you want to understand, back to ICT, who those channels are, what they're selling. And it goes really deep, right? What are they doing in terms of the businesses? What is, what's the business need? Before you pay Gartner for a quadrant, Reno's a Gartner quadrant tells you about the landscape, you could pay $20,000 for a Gartner report, you better find out who's, what's the need, what's the pain point your thing solves if you want to sell to somebody. And then, even further deep dive on these channels. 
So it gets pretty complicated. As you can see, it's a lot of data. I'm not asking you to understand it, but why do we do that? Because we want to know what channel might take me to market because with all due respect to all the advice I hear sometimes in Melbourne, switched on CEOs, et cetera, if they're so switched on, they'll know how to understand channel partnerships and take you into channel to sell your stuff. So one way we do that is we try and talk about stealth market strategies. And I'm gonna talk about that, and I'm gonna talk about our uh, model. So there's a way of marketing your stuff, many ways. Some of them are typical to your business courses and so forth, like a platform offering versus a product offering. In layman's terms, in simple terms, if you had a new network architecture, your plan would be, I'm the new network. Well, then you'd be up against Cisco and Microsoft and the like. Might be a little expensive, right? But if you, but, 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 this, but the strength is, you know, hey, it's, that's your market message and you're done. The weakness is, is holy cow, if I've gotta take on Cisco, because I'm a Cisco killer, might be a little expensive, right? And it's competitive invitation. It invites Cisco, even if I am that disruptive, Cisco will say, we've got a lot of money so disruptive, let's just buy them or beat them. So another art form that we like is elephant hunting. What's elephant hunting? Elephant hunting is understanding the thinking and intonation and culture of a big elephant. So with AT&T, it's pretty cool to know that those enterprise mobility folks want to sell software. We'll find out what kind of software are they selling. What's hot, maybe your thing fits in there. eBay is an elephant I like to hunt. eBay talks about connected commerce. How many of you think you might fit into something like connected commerce, some innovative commerce tool? Come on, folks. Do any of you sell something? <laughs> Seriously, do you sell something? How many people sell something? How many people sell something with an internet connection? <laughs> so maybe you can make an argument that you have connected commerce. Understanding how to tee up that value proposition to the elephant called eBay, shooting the elephant, which also is PayPal, might be pretty good, because they have innovation support. If you think you're innovative in the context of connected commerce, you can give retailers data better. You can help them sell their goods better. You can help them catalog their goods better. That's connected commerce. And if you can do that, then maybe eBay will help you do that for its $14 billion a year in retailers. Stealth adopters, what is an adapter? Every company in this room needs a use case and an adopter. So find one, pay them if you have to. Make them happy, give it away for free. But someone adopting your product and using it is gonna give you a lot of benefits so that becomes a market strategy. Partnership channels we spend a lot of time on already and incubation strategies. Incubators are get to know Rowan, get in his incubator. But there are other incubators, right? Global companies have them, Telstra has them, everybody has incubation, sometimes that's a, a strategy. When you do incubate or work with incubators, I have some thoughts to share with you before we go to the next point, which is, which are, don't tweet and take the two T's I don't like. I'm gonna explain to you what I mean. It's just my observation. If you tweet met this, did this, da, and you take. I met this guy, switched on, da, da, da. You didn't do a lot. You just tweeted and took. Follow up, interact, learn, ideate, share. Not all things become reality only if they're tweeted. <coughs> Not all things are reality only if you can find them on Google. You gotta not lose the human interaction. So whether you're talking to a VC who will not give you money, but might 10 years from now, maintain the relationship. Don't tweet and take, don't be limited to that. Mentorship and incubation is about all the other value that this great incubator can give you, MAP and others. It's about whole lists of 
content capital. Content capital is not who's on Facebook or LinkedIn with all due respect. It's the relationship that you form with somebody you get to meet through an incubator like this. Don't lose that human interaction. Uh, our strategy. So we want to identify friendly adapters. We want to look at your use case opportunities. And sometimes they're uh, sector driven. A little bit of scale. If you had something for a municipality like Victoria, VicGov, in case you don't know already, VicGov definitely gives more for ICT innovation than any other state in Australia, that's for sure. And if you can work that, nav navigate that channel and get a use case, that's cool. And here's why it's cool. Not because you can get money from VicGov or have some fun in Victoria, good, good on you if you do. But because there are 6,700 municipalities in America, 6,700. So if I've got a good use case, with VicGov, pretty cool market to go to, right? Um, and obviously there are other markets like healthcare and so forth, and we've talked about some of them. Legislation and industry-driven compliance. A, be aware of it, because whatever your solution is, you probably want to comply with something or some bloke in the legislative context is thinking about making you comply. But more important, sometimes the compliance and the market necessity will drive your innovation. So back to Rowan's product. If I'm a cater waiter in Melbourne Uni and I want a job at the local catering hall, I might, in New York anyway, uh, want a liquor, uh, an ability to serve liquor, right? So that's a compliance thing. So if you have that UI, that user interface, that has that, you just did an awesome thing. And of course, because he's rowing, you've done that, right? There you go, mate. So the point is compliance can drive your innovation and can increase your product, your service offering, and your UI. Uh, geographic and subject matter licensee. So this is an interesting point. If I want a use case or someone to use me, um, I want to look at how someone who needs my subject, my issue, my solution, my problem, and maybe if there's a specific geography that needs it, um, maybe there's a way to make them a perpetual license just for that place, and now I can sell it every, to everyone else. So if you're Braden, who has cutting edge incredible, off the chart, half of us don't even understand it, ways to collect electricity off the grid and so forth. Maybe he gives away, God forbid, the lawyers in Australia tell him not to do it, but he gives away a perpetual license to one singular user. Having done that, he now has a friendly adapter, he now has a use case, he has, has something that will help us monetize him as we go forward. And then there's the hybrid of them all, and I call it a, uh, a Z to A mode. Remember I told you about the VAR. The VAR that if he sells $1 million of your stuff, he's going to make $250,000, right? 25%. So if you get money, and I could be a VAR for you, before you'd pay that same CEO, remember the switched on CEO cost you $300,000? Well, before you do that, maybe pay the VAR. <laughs> Pay the bar 50 grand, mate, to start selling you. This is the bloke who wants to sell $1 million of your stuff. A lot faster, a lot easier. So there's all ways of hybriding this market entry. And then there's integration and teaming. I won't repeat how much you have to team, but you got to do it. Way, the way we work is we look at the vertical market opportunities. We're really consistent. Everything we spoke, I've spoken about so far, we got to do. We've got to say hello to you, understand your ROI, look at your short-term revenue needs and capital needs, and then try and find some strategy for stealth adapters, as we've been talking about. Ultimately, eventually, we've got a plan that ultimately leads to a full-scale rollout. We could talk about that when we get into Q&A, but that's, that's the way we work, and it's the way you should think. You should think in terms of a project plan. What's your 18-month plan? What's your pathway? Uh, key considerations when you're preparing for 
global market entry. It doesn't have to be U.S. anywhere. Here are some. So do you understand the competitive landscape? Competitive landscape is not this boring chart of who looks like you. It might be who's near you and who's spending. Who's buying something that was almost like what you do? Who's spending on something exactly like you, but you could do it better? Or who missed you? Back to the T's. How many of those, once you have that spin data that told you what, their, what those SKUs were, who's selling? Maybe you see there's 20% growth in St. Louis. The people there are really fat and want to, low, low, uh, and want to lose weight. It's pretty important. But you know what? There was, a gro there was a drop in Safeway. Safeway's a big supermarket chain, and it turns out they had medicinal tea. They lost it. That may or may not mean bad news. May mean that the tea company that was selling it just went out of business, and you just won the lottery. So that's important data across a landscape. Uh, have you identified a unique value proposition? Um, on Friday, in your country's financial review, back page, there was an article that's quoted a Professor Powers in Harvard who runs a CEO course for CEOs around the world. He calls up the CEOs and he says, I've got a course for you. And it was a funny article because it says one of the CEOs, a local guy in Sydney, is like, I thought the bloke was crazy. Like, why would I? I'm a CEO of a major company. Well, you got, just don't, you know, what are you bothering me? But he eventually realized that the guy wasn't crazy. And then he does this course. And so this is global CEOs, Harvard, two-day course, because this bloke thinks he can do it. And you know what his three things are? It's what's your strategy? And has strategic direct direction, look it up uh, in your financial paper on Friday, um, was what's your value proposition? Even CEOs of big companies have to figure that out. Guys, save the time. In one sentence, what is your salient, distinctive value proposition? That is your biggest problem. When you make a billion dollars and you hire that CEO that gets to get calls from Harvard and be in the financial review, he's still trying to sort that. Get it right. It's the biggest thing. What's your value proposition? And that sometimes means what's your raison d'etre? What is your reason for being? Why are you even here? If you don't know what the single reason you exist for, you got a problem. What I like about Rowan's cater waiter thing, whether it's good, bad, or otherwise, it's got a purpose. It's got a purpose. And so the initial raison d'etre is connecting the, let's call it cater waiter, applicant, or onboarded inductee to a catering hall, connecting the hirers of those folks, whether it be a catering hall, restaurant, and the like, to, to them, that's a raison d'etre. But Rowan, because he's pretty cool, might take it further. He might want to expand upon his raison d'etre and say, I'm waking up every morning, and I'm going to empower these folks. Whether it's a uni student or an immigrant, I'm going to change the game and get them a job faster, better, quicker via mobile enterprise. Now, he talks to me as an investor. I'm like, dude, sound like you know what your reason for being is. You know why you're waking up in the morning. If you can't do that, that's not good. A word on speaking about it. This is a word on Australianisms. Tall puppy syndrome. What the hell is that? You guys, puppy, sorry, I always say puppy and you think I mean puppy. I didn't mean the dog. I know puppy like as in opium seeds, I get it, right? Uh, but the, the, tall, pu I can't pronounce, whatever, what he said. And, and big noting, are you guys like retarded? If you have to get money from me and you can't big note, please don't come to America. Please, go home. Stay in Victoria, have coffee, and don't big note, and good, good on you. In other words, you got to be able to believe in your product. Tell me how great you are. I want to hear from Rowan. It's cater waiters, cater girls. We're going to change the game. We're going to empower the disenfranchised. The, the disenfranchised. We're going to get them jobs. We're going to onboard them. We've got interface with LinkedIn. We're going to get the resumes up. We're going to change the game. Because I thought of it. That's pretty cool, right? You gotta, be, you gotta come at me if I'm an investor in America. If you sit this way and you're scared, that's no good. Drink more coffee. Yeah. <laughs>
Which vertical segment you, you think you gotta start thinking about that? What's your revenue model? Now, even if you don't have a revenue model, lie and say you do. <laughs> say you're thinking about one. Here's a cool one that's varying in the valley. Really, I, I have an Israeli company that said this to, to VCs last week. It was amazing. She did so well. They said, what's your revenue? I said, we don't need one. The guy's like, what do you mean? Because we're going to get to 10 million customers, and then you're going to tell me what the revenue model was. <laughs> Boom, she shot him down. They were like a tank commander from Israel. I'm like, Good for you. <laughs> Boom. Know how to answer that revenue model thing, right? Uh, friendly adopters we've talked about. Who will you partner with, collaborate, etc. And advisors. Few words on advice. All due respect for my fellow members of the bar here, there, and everywhere. If they tell you to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on IP, or even tens of thousands of dollars, and then a year later you still haven't gotten a market, and you're like, oh, should we re renew in, uh, the application in Canada? Dude, come to market instead. So uh, stop spending money on all this overthinking and whatever. And IMs, seriously, with the IM? Are you serious? Don't pay for an IM when you can do a seven page slide deck. Because if you're coming to America for VC money and you hand me an, an IM, it is going in the wastebasket before I ever call you back. I'm never gonna read an Australian IM. I'm never even gonna read an American PPM, private placement memorandum, which is our version of the IM. But if you give me seven slides, and in those slides you say what your reason for being is, you say how you're disruptive or different, you say how you can scale, you show me that you did the data, I've got medicinal teas, and I can get into Safeway, and here's how, and here's my pricing, and it's better than the other eight companies. Well, now I'm talking to you, right? Seven slides. I, if you can't do that, don't, don't talk to me. That's really hard to do, by the way, folks. And I'm, I'm sure that Map will be doing some things on, on the deck, right, on the pitch, profoundly important. So when you think about advisors, think about that stuff. Tax structure and whatever, seriously, if you are, you're, you're a startup, a lot of you have, you gotta pay your bill, you gotta pay your rent. If you have the time or inclination to hear some bloke in Melbourne talk about taxes for more than an hour, there's something wrong with you. You, you gotta like lower the threshold of advice. Now, that doesn't mean advice isn't important. Your structure is really important. Get it from MAP if you can. Get it from really switched on experts. MAP works with, I think I can take credit for introducing you, DLA. DLA is the largest law firm on planet Earth. A lot of times, a lot of the work and the relationship driving and the explanations, we, as you've seen firsthand, Rowan, will give you that advice you know, on the come. Meaning, take the advice, learn from it, develop it, because we want to see you succeed. The goals of a good advisor is to get you to the next step, not to take your money. Uh, consider your corporate structure, that's important as we've said, but, not, but don't get too crazy about it as we've said. How do you package and what are your needs, timing, and budget? Project plans are really cool. Gantt charts are good. Tell me what's happening across 18 months from January on, right? And do it in, in, in different uh, categories. Here's what we're gonna do in development. Here's where we're gonna do our QA. Here's where we're gonna do second version. Here's where we're gonna do testing. That's important because I see you've thought of these things. Here's where we're gonna do marketing. Here's when we're gonna mo roll out. Here's where we're gonna identify channel partners. Now that's important also because you're gonna tell me what you're gonna use your money on. I might, if I'm an advisor or a channel partner or an investor, I wanna hear your plan, I wanna give an opportunity to be involved with that and look at the budget necessary. This is the last slide, so we're gonna get into questions and answers. This is about funding. Pretty simple. Uh, there's all kinds of funders, a few comments. The first category, these angel investors, high net worth folks. A few annoying concepts, or comments, or jokes, or not. 
a person who has a lot of money from their daddy and invests in things is not necessarily an ICT expert. So there are a lot of family funds, and some of them are quite brilliant switched on, but just because they have money, that doesn't mean they know your product better than you do. Angel investors are great, but they should share your values if you want to pitch to them. Private equity is PE, right? Banks and so forth, interesting players, and VC or venture capital. I'm going to stop there with the following observations. I think it's fair to say that in America, in the Valley, folks are friendlier when they're investing. They want to succeed. Many investors will say they are value-added investors or synergistic investors. I would ask them to define that. And I'd want to be real precise. To me, a synergistic investor, I can think of one that I mentioned to Rowan for his cater waiter thing. This particular, so I won't mention his name, he ran one of the largest hospitality companies on planet Earth. When he sold it, he made so much money that he's now an investor. So he switched on in hospitality. If he gives you a little money and he introduces you to one hotel, Rowan's done. He made it. That is a synergistic investor. A synergistic investor is not necessarily a rich person with ideas and eight dum-dums he hired to do due diligence on you. That is not synergy. That is not helping elevate your money. So be as demanding of your investors are, uh, as, as many as they are on you, on them. Share value. Value may be, help me get to round three. Help me get to series A because you're seeding me. Help me get to a series B. I want to be an IPO. I want to share the plan of an exit. Exits are not the only thing in life. Maybe you want to actually grow and keep your company. There's an idea. An economy that's only about exiting, that sounds pretty depressing. The notion, the very notion of VC, and I love VCs, and many, many are my friends, but the notion is that we're going to give to 20 companies with the complete expectation that 19 are going to fail. We're never going to help them. We don't really give a shit. But the one that will succeed will be success as defined by us. All your employees are fired. We had an exit. We told to your competitor. You're done. You promised your employees stock. Yeah, we take care of them, but go, go away, parachute away. Don't worry, you'll think of something else to do. We'll have an exit again. That's not building a company necessarily. It may be good for some of you, but that there's other ways to exit or liquidate or become a bigger company. Monetize your offer. Public listings are one way. I would have said many months ago, don't do penny stocks. But two of the Australian companies I've had the privilege of representing have been kicking ass on the ASX the last four months. So that's something to consider. If you get cash, though, in any one of these ways, you want to use the cash wisely. And you want to stay really true and consistent with all the things we've talked about. What's your pathway? What's your plan? Your use of proceeds should match that Gantt chart we were talking about. Your use of proceeds should match the plan. The plan should match the raison d'etre. You should never change why you came in the room and what you believe your value proposition is. Uh, and then there's a hybrid of all the, away, all the above. Sometimes an investor can be a licensee or an adopter. And then there's this thing about the flip up, which I won't talk to, but I'm sure Rowan's going to organize a presentation if he hasn't already uh, in this series on the flip up, which is essentially keeping the IP often in Australia, but flipping up into a US entity or Singaporean entity or whatever that can raise money in that locale if that's where you think you have investment dollars. With that, my friends, did you learn anything? Well, then I will say thank you and then ask for questions. Thank you.